All right, everybody, welcome back to the best hour of their day. Fern here. I am here with Dr. Zoe Hartham. Um, some of you may have heard of her. Some of you may not. I had the very pleasure, uh, distinct pleasure of uh, watching her present at the CrossFit Trainer Summit this year in San Diego. And uh, after that presentation, uh, Ackerman and I were like, hey, we need to get on the show because she's got just really awesome stuff to say. So um, she is in Wales and she's like six hours ahead. So if this is a little bit broken up, we apologize. But uh, thanks for coming on the show. Zoe. I appreciate it. Oh, thanks so much for having me. That's a really kind intro. Thank you. Um, so your background is not like you started into this nutrition like a little bit later than most people. Is that correct? Yes, correct. So how did you like at what point talk a little bit like at what point you decide like, hey, this I want to kind of dive into this chronic disease, this nutrition fiasco that is that we're all kind of really coming to to light on. Okay, um, I've always been absolutely fascinated by obesity. So I'm a mathematician by background. I did maths at Cambridge, um, switched to economics, but I'm a numbers person. And it has never made sense to me that I've never met anyone who wants to be overweight, let alone obese, and yet 70% of the developed world is one of those, obese or overweight. It just doesn't make sense. So I was trying to understand why is it that we have an obesity epidemic? And I'm generally fascinated by weight loss and dieting and food and nutrition and all the rest of it. But it was this real obesity paradox that, that kind of captured me. And when you go back to understand the obesity epidemic, you've got to understand when it started. And there's a brilliant chart that comes from the NHANES US sources where you look at obesity and overweight, the separate lines and then the two lines added together and you look at them from about 1960, mid-1960s, and then at about 1976 to 1980, the two trajectories just take off like an airplane. I mean, it's just so striking, it's not true. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to say, so what happened there? What happened? Because something happened. We went from, I mean, in the UK, we went from a couple of percent obesity in 1972 to 25% obesity at the end of the last century. So we just followed you guys just a little bit behind. Mm -hmm. And you have to say, so what happened? So I'm open to any suggestion, any hypothesis, but there's one that I've got, and I'm not alone in having this one, that it's to do with our dietary guidelines. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at the evidence of, did we eat more? No, we didn't. Actually, the UK data shows that we've actually been eating less over those decades when obesity increased tenfold. Did we do less? No, actually, we've been doing more. We've got more marathons, more marathon runners, more gyms, more boxes. I can't move in the streets now for tripping over people doing cycling, running, mm -hmm. whatever. We didn't, we didn't eat more. We didn't do less. Something else happened. And again, I'm open to any other hypotheses but the thing that really struck me was that we changed our dietary guidelines so you know, one of the things that i've struggled with immensely over the years is you know so there, obviously nutrition is a contentious topic and yes and it's and i've always struggled with okay well i guess we can put us in the crossfit kind of bucket where we're kind of like hey the dietary guidelines are garbage it's not an energy balance issue um because if we assume it is an energy balance the the numbers don't speak to that meaning people are only more aware they're only doing more exercise and chronic disease and obesity keep climbing so it's got to be something else and Absolutely. and anybody to have that conversation with like it's it's just a real tough topic to discuss because people sit in one of two camps and they're very very hesitant to move from that camp yeah yeah there's a massive debate um there's the a calorie is a calorie calories in equals calories out i actually did a talk at my local box last night and i started off talking about nutrition 101 and then we went on to what actually is weight loss and how do you lose weight and calories have just got nothing to do with it. I mean, if you really think that all you need to do is eat less and or do more, you have not looked at the evidence as I have. Going back to 1917, Benedict, first dietary deficit, calorie deficit, um, experiment undertaken on 12 men. And that experiment has then been repeated throughout Ansel Keys, throughout Stunkard, McLaren, Hume, up to the France data from 2007. There's a 2015 article mm -hmm. basically saying the chance of losing weight from deficit dieting is about one in 210 for women. And I can't remember what it was for men. I mean, it's, it's absurd. And of course, we know that it's, it's incredibly unsuccessful. Yeah, my... 
my my issue with that has always been so <clears throat> my wife and I've done nutrition kind of counseling with a lot of people and the vast majority of them that we work with all under eat number one meaning like they're not eating anything that would resemble total caloric intake that would be even close to their BMR so their basal metabolic rate yes. and a lot of them will have them consume almost double their BMR and lose weight so for that alone that that's just like a pretty strong kind of counterpoint to like, Hey, maybe that's not the best solution is just to yeah. reduce caloric intake. Because if I can essentially like, you know, in air quotes, overfeed somebody, which we know we're not overfeeding them, but we're overfeeding them compared to dietary guidelines. Why are they losing weight? Like that doesn't make sense. But you know, you mentioned such an interesting thing there. So the basal metabolic rate. So think about the basal metabolic rate. You go back to nutrition 101 and you say what macronutrients support the basal metabolic rate. And of course, the primary macronutrients that support things like body repair, maintenance, muscle building, fighting infection, building bone density are fat and protein. Mm -hmm. Carbohydrates are okay for energy. And that's about it. So what you can have with your clients, particularly if they've been on a calorie deficit diet, because what the evidence shows, that evidence back to Benedict 1917, what tends to happen is people lose weight in the short term up to about six months, then they regain it and then more. And what they've actually done in that process is lose muscle, lose lean tissue. And so when they regain the weight, they're actually, they gain more body fat than they had before. So they actually need fewer calories going forward than they did before they started the calorie deficit diet. So they're in this vicious cycle of eating less and less and getting hungrier and hungrier. And the more they try to eat less, the more they make bad food choices. So if they don't eat the fat and protein that actually the body is crying out for. They eat carbohydrates because carbohydrates have got four calories per gram. Fat has got nine. Protein is quite difficult to overeat as an isolated macronutrient anyway. It tends to come with fat. Um, so you tend to have meat, fish, eggs, dairy, fat, proteins. So they just get into this terrible, terrible mess where they're not eating too much by any means. As you've noticed, they're eating the wrong things. Yes. And you brought up something interesting at the summit. There was like your presentation was really, really uh, just fun to listen to. And um, What's interesting is number one, you're talking to an audience who virtually everybody agrees with you, but mm -hmm. uh, the, you brought up something and it's a pretty, I think this is one of your big talking points is there are no essential carbohydrates. And I, yeah. and I say that because <clears throat> I don't think, but I don't want to speak for you. I don't think your stance is like, you should not eat carbs. I think it's, you're just trying to de-emphasize carbohydrates in the role of nutrition. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad that came across as it did because it's just a nutritional fact that there is no essential carbohydrate. There are essential proteins. We know those as the essential amino acids. There are essential fats, which of course we know is omega-3 and omega-6. There are no essential carbohydrates. If you and I eat no carbohydrate between now and the day we die, provided we eat enough fat and protein, which is how the panel on macronutrients 2005 put it, provided you eat enough fat and protein, we will be just fine. Now, I'm not saying that we should do that. I'm just, as you say, trying to put that nutritional fact in the context of our dear governments telling us to have at least 55% of our diet in the form of carbohydrate. That's the one thing we don't need. And they're saying, major your diet on that one thing. And of course, <clears throat> I don't think we've evolved to eat that level of carbohydrate. I think up to 60, 70% of our diet in the form of carbohydrate when do we ever get to the point that we can break down body fat? We are constantly in a state of fat storing mm -hmm. because, of course, carbs stimulate insulin. Insulin is the fat storing hormone. Every time we eat carbs, glucose goes into the bloodstream. The body goes into an emergency ER crisis situation, get the glucose out, calls upon insulin. And pretty much the developed world is in a constant fat storing scenario. And we've got to reverse that. And one of the things we've got to do to reverse that is to say, cut back massively on your carbohydrate. Just stop having your body in this crisis mode the whole time. Interestingly, athletes are quite susceptible to type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. um, almost as much as overweight people, because, of course, athletes carb load, carb load, carb load, yeah. years on end. And then they end up like Professor Tim Oaks or Steve Finney or Steve Redgrave, our Olympic grower they end up with diabetes because they've just had too much carbohydrate too often the body says enough's enough so that brings up a, a good i don't know kind of segue but 
knowing that there's no essential carbohydrates, meaning we don't necessarily need them to survive, uh, that kind of leads me into the, how do we start having the conversation about a calorie is not just a calorie I, and, or just the calories are not really what we should be focusing on. Cause I was, I was thinking about, I watched a video years ago of um, Gary Taubes and he was doing the math on if you reduced somebody's caloric intake, what that should equal into loss in pounds. And what he was illustrating was it just doesn't work. Like mathematically it does not work that way. So yeah. what, you know, CrossFitters and gym owners, Obviously, most of us are not doctors uh, in this, particularly in this field. How do we start to educate people on like, what should our clients know about this whole myth that a calorie is a calorie and all we need to worry about is like our total caloric intake? Um, I think Gary puts it in a good way and I often choke. I mean, you've seen me. I'm short, I'm tiny, I'm very <laughs> petite. In in your currency, we do pounds and stones. So what am I? I'm seven stone, which is seven fourteens, which is 98. And I'm probably about 106 or seven pounds or something. So let's say 110. Yeah keep the maths easy the calorie theory says that i just have to cut back by a thousand calories a day and i eat a lot so that is actually possible okay i could arguably do that and i'd i'd weigh about 10 pounds in a year's time i mean it is that stupid and when i say patients <laughs> people laugh and i say why you dance a calorie control diet every monday morning because they think they're going to cut back by a thousand calories calories a day lose two pounds that week they're going to cut back by 500 lose a pound a week it's yeah and the other thing there is that absolutely like absolutely absurd yeah and that it doesn't work like if that if because everybody's been doing that at least in the u.s i'm not really sure as i'm not as familiar with the uk but everybody's Same. been following those everybody's Same. been following everybody's been following those guidelines and it doesn't seem to be working yeah and and, and two things that I, I would say to, to get across to people, I'll just um, get these in the, in the right order. So um, try, right. Okay, so the first mistake that they made, they, they, they think that, let's say you, you cut back by this thousand calories a day and you have a deficit that should uh, be a deficit of two pounds of fat alone in that week. They act as if the body is a cash machine for fat. So they act as if the body is just gonna say, there you go, there's two pounds of fat, now we're all equal. That is so difficult to describe how completely, stupidly, insanely absurd that belief is because the body will do anything it can not to lose weight. It's, it's life -threatening. throughout evolution. Fat has been what has sustained us through the lean periods. So it's life threatening. So the body is not going to give up fat. So what is the body going to do? First thing, you try to go on a diet, you try to eat less. First thing that the body is going to do is to try to get you to eat more. So the minute you go on a calorie, yep, about is food. All you want to do is eat. You to do less. You put less in. You're too tired to go to the gym. You're too tired to do the gardening. You're too tired to walk the dog. It will make sure that you do less. It will make you make bad choices. It will make you choose stupid things like rice cakes over scrambled eggs in butter or whatever but it does some other things we've got nine circulatory systems and it just shuts down anything it can so how many people know a female who's gone on an extreme calorie deficit diet how quick do the period stop the body says the entire reproductive system i'm just shutting down mm -hmm. you're not in a fit state to look after yourself there is no way i'm going to let you have a baby right now the circulatory system slows down the person is frozen the heating system is turned off the body will take calcium out of the bones if you're not putting it in through your mouth the, the body just adapts it just adapts the calorie theory the theorists make no allowance whatsoever for what the body does mentally psychologically physically and hormonally in response to a calorie deficit diet it, the insanity just knows no bounds the, the other thing that I found tough to wrap my brain around that argument that, it, it, hey, all we really need to do is reduce caloric intake and then increase our output. Well, if we're reducing our caloric intake and then generally in most instances, if we're going to talk about practical application of this idea, we're taking somebody who is maybe not sedentary, but probably pretty close to sedentary and then increasing their physical output. How are we supposed to fuel that physical output with decreased caloric intake? Like that Absolutely. just doesn't make sense. I'm like, yeah. you're, you're, you're stealing while trying. It's like trying to 
it's like saying I'm going to drive my car farther, but I'm going to put less gas in it. Yeah. And, and what the calorie theorists think is that you're, you've got, I don't know, 50 pounds of fat on your body. The body will just give up that fat. There you go. That's the fuel. Now you will know as an extreme, extremely impressive athlete that to become fat adapted, which is what that effectively is, takes a serious amount of time. And it also takes certain physiological conditions. So if, if you just forget calories for a while and just say, okay, what is weight loss? What is actually the, the, what is weight loss? I can't put it any simpler than that. So body fat is a structure called triglyceride, Mm -hmm. which is a backbone of glycerol with three fatty acids. Mm -hmm. And when the body goes to break that structure down, that is weight loss in action. That is what it actually is. Now, there are certain physiological circumstances in which that can happen, and there are many physiological circumstances in which that cannot happen. So if at any time you have insulin present in the body, that cannot happen because breaking down that triglyceride structure relies on glucagon to break it down and glucagon and insulin are antagonists they are never in play at the same time so if you've ever got insulin present you will not break down body fat okay i did not know that if you've got glucose present if you've got stored glucose which we know of glycogen present then when you get in the situation that you're running low on fuel the body will say, hey, glucagon, go and get me some fuel. And the first thing that glucagon will look for, because it's the easiest source of fuel, it's the lazy source of fuel, is glucose. Mm -hmm. So it will look for the stored glycogen, and we can store about, I don't know, 1,500 to 2,000 calories worth of glycogen in the muscles and in the liver. So think about that average person who's eating in 60 to 70 percent of their diet in the form of carbohydrate as they've been told to do on a daily basis they have really good glycogen storerooms so any time there isn't insulin there isn't carbohydrate and glucagon gets to go and look for some fuel it's got glycogen you will never break down body fat if you've got an alternative fuel source available it just doesn't happen that's interesting. I wasn't aware of. I wouldn't. I. I didn't know that there. There was that kind of hierarchy with regard to how it gets used. And obviously, I'm not a doctor, but. Um. I think there. Are, there are extreme. Or they say some of the extreme athletes will say that there are extreme exercise circumstances in which fat will be burned preferentially to glucose, but they are so rare. I mean, we're talking a particular sweet spot on VO2 max. They are so rare that obese sedentary person who is trying to lose weight does not need to worry about their circumstances. That person needs to think about the fact that if they are grazing on carbohydrates all day long, which is what you do if you're following a calorie controlled diet and you're trying to get the biggest bang for your buck, you just chew chewing gum and suck on boiled sweets all day long because they've got zero fat. Trust me, I did it as a teenager. Um, You can never get get to the situation that your body can even start to have the chance of breaking down body fat. It's impossible. It just can't happen. So I don't know. I don't know if you can do this. I was looking, I had no, first of all, I had no idea you'd written so many books and had been like, uh, like co-authored so many books. So I was just looking through some of them, the obesity epidemic, the diet fix, why do we overeat? Um, stop counting calories. And then you have kind of your own nutritional guidelines in there. What, what would you, if you could summarize your stance on nutrition, what would it be? Yeah, it's really easy, actually. Number one, eat real food. Okay, so it comes from a farm or a field, not a factory. Um, fish in breaded sticks, whatever, don't. It's not that complex. Uh, that's number one. Number two is choose that food for the nutrients it provides. And if you spend a little bit of time on one of the best websites in the world, which is called nutritiondata.com, you can put in any food that you like, put it in by 100 grams. It's the easiest way to compare across foods. Um, I just have to know which foods are healthy and which foods. Yeah, and this was, um, that was a question so I had. So I'm putting things like liver, which I know is fabulous. Yep. Can you yeah, get- yeah. Do, you, do you want to find, uh, if, could you give some of the data on liver? Because that when you put that that like spreadsheet up at the summit, my mind exploded. I was like, every human being should be eating liver all the time. <laughs> <laughs> 
pretty much it, it is insane so what i've got i've got a little postcard that i give away at talk so i just happened to have one on my desk as i was doing a presentation last I have night it sitting in my office. um and i, have I it sitting in my office. oh there you go so okay so i put in liver because i know it is the single most nutritious food on the planet and i know that from spending a lot of time on nutrition data and i've never been able to find anything more nutritious and nobody else has either some people write in and say oh what about oysters you investigate them no they still don't win Sirloin steak, because red meat is a really good all-rounder. It's particularly good for zinc. You can put in eggs, you can put in dairy, you can put in oily fish. That would be a really good one to put in. Um, you can put in a fruit, because they're telling us to eat five a day, which has no evidence base whatsoever. Put in one of these so-called healthy, in inverted commas, whole grains. You can put in legumes. They're so-called lentils, beans, or whatever. Um, broccoli, a green vegetable. I do di different charts in different presentations. But you can just see that liver absolutely cleans up. It cleans up on protein quality, retinol, which is the form of vitamin A that the body needs. Um, it cleans up on pretty much all of the B vitamins, except maybe B1. Um, then you've got fantastic uh, inputs of iron. It's very good for zinc. It's just red meat happens to be better. It's just outstanding. And when you look at what we're told to eat, the fruit, the healthy whole grains, the legumes, the vegetables, the vegetable oils, and then you compare those for the things that we need, which is complete protein, essential fats, vitamins and minerals. You compare those with the things that are demonized, meat, fish, eggs and dairy. And meat, fish, eggs and dairy have everything we need in mm -hmm. fantastic quantities in the right form. The stuff they're telling us to eat has practically none of what we need, let alone in the right form. And it's just like if there's one chart that shows you our guidelines are wrong, it's that chart. So my second principle is choose your food for the nutrients, your real food for the nutrients it provides. And then you will be drawn to meat, fish, eggs and dairy, green things, some nuts and some seeds. And, and that's about it. And the third principle that I tell people is eat a maximum of three times a day. And to make it memorable, I say, unless you are a cow or want to be the size of a cow, stop grazing because we just eat the whole day long. And we wonder why we're so fat because that's that's what cows do we just happen to graze on things that are even less suitable for us i've, I've found myself just due to my work schedule kind of uh more gravitating towards something that resembles and not even intentionally just more intermittent fasting so i'll eat in the morning typically like eggs bacon a little bit of fruit but very like protein and fat heavy and then I'll go like the whole day and then look and eat something at dinner that looks very similar but maybe a little bit heavier on carbs but um, and I find that only eating twice a day in most instances, like sustain the, almost the same body weight for the past 20 years, I'm almost 40, uh, probably almost the exact same muscle mass. And um, yeah, I don't eat all day long. I eat twice in most instances and it works out yeah. just fine. Yeah. And, and I'm the same. I've been pretty much the same weight for exactly that kind of period of time. Um, I have to watch it. I, I actually have a tendency to go lower weight. Um, than I would actually like to do. So I do eat three times a day. Um, I also have, um, I, I just have a need for fuel that regularly, but I'm quite happy to have my evening meal quite early. And then okay. there might easily be a 12 or 13 hour gap until I eat the next morning. Now I'm not doing that deliberately. It yeah. just suits my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, it helps me sleep better if I eat earlier. It means I can do things in the evening and I'm not thinking, you know, when am I going to have dinner? It's out of the way. Um, it, it just, it just works for me. What wouldn't work for me would be these people that are not eating all day or they have an evening meal and then they don't eat until breakfast the day after the day after or whatever. It's like, mm, I'm, I'm not sure on this. Um, yeah. I think there's some good evidence for two meals rather than three. And I think there's some, some good evidence starting to come through for the overnight fast, extending the overnight fast, if only to give insulin a rest and to actually yeah. give your body the chance to burn body fat. But I am a bit worried about these people that just think, oh, I'm just not going to eat for a couple of days and that's going to be good. I think your body's then going to start shutting down. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I joked with the journalists that when 
when all of this sort of intermittent fasting, 5-2 diets, all that stuff came out, this journalist said, well, well, what do you think? And I said, well, you know, not eating for a whole day and then eating whatever you want the next day. I, you know, I kind of did that as a teenager. It's just, it was called bulimia back then. So um, <laughs> it's just not what I would advise. Really. I don't mean to laugh at that. It's not funny, but it is kind of funny. Um, I, I, I don't mind. I can laugh at it. But I remember the question came up at Low Carb Denver last year and I intervened and said, guys, we've got to talk eating disorders here because a heck of a lot of people in this field have come from a background of an eating disorder or are still not having a great relationship with food um, in the way that you and I can enjoy at the moment and have enjoyed for a long time um, and, and trying to encourage people to eat nothing and then eat moderately or eat what you want or whatever I'm, I'm really not convinced it's healthy when yeah. we know that so many people don't have a basic healthy relationship with food just get a good relationship with food first of all um stop thinking of crap as as treats it's crap stop thinking oh i deserve a reward i'm gonna have a bag of nachos i mean just stop it we, we've got to get the mindset right and then if you find that you can skip a meal and not want to overeat at the next meal and if you can skip a meal and you feel good you don't feel bad you don't feel deprived fine but that's the advanced class we've got to get some basics first yeah, i think uh, i think rob wolf brought it up once and he was talking about people's just their the the term cheat meal is like this weird oxymoron because the term <laughs> the term cheat would would suggest that i'm getting ahead but when i use it in terms <laughs> of nutrition it's just a massive setback and it's like the, yeah. the whole just the way it's used in general is, is very odd if you really think about it and try to unpack that the, i like uh, that the yeah. the question i have and you i know you have a lot of theories on this which i thought was really funny when you presented but when you look at the nutrient density of these foods and it and clearly think like you know, like lean proteins and, and, and liver and things like that start coming out on top, it really starts to beg the question, why would anybody move towards a vegan diet? Like if, if those foods are so devoid of nutrients and these are so packed with nutrients, how could somebody possibly fall in the camp of not eating meat? Can you talk a little about your thoughts on that? Yeah, because I was vegetarian for 20 years. Um, and I, and so I brought I, that up because I think it's important context yeah. for you in this conversation. Yeah, no, it's um, it's it's very interesting actually. I think some people, um, particularly younger people, particularly people with a weight problem, particularly perhaps females, we do know that the profile of vegetarian stroke vegans is very heavily swayed uh, towards uh, being female and being younger. Um, and I think a little bit of it. it start with is and i think there was a bit of this mentality going on with me um oh great i can cut out whole food groups um so i'm bound to lose weight because if i go to somebody's house for dinner or i'm at a, a, a some function and i say i don't eat meat and fish then there's like a whole lot of stuff that i just don't have to eat um the fact that then you end up with the potatoes and the dessert and the bread roll or whatever kind of escapes you you've actually skipped the best bit um so i think there's a little bit of that going on but there are, there are basic three reasons that people go vegetarian um, the one that's wrong is that they think it's healthier and we can get back to that the second one is because they don't like the idea of eating animals and the third one is and this has become increasingly the one thrown at, um, at other people is that they think it's better for the planet so really really quickly it's absolutely not healthier i've just done an open post on my site about veganuary which is massive in the uk i don't know how big it is in the u in the us but it's about going vegan for january mm -hmm. um, and i just go through all the nutrients that you are not going to get from a vegan diet retinol vitamin a b12 um d3 heme iron omega-3s and you're probably not going to get enough calcium, iron, and some other nutrients. And, and Is that posted on your website, zoeharkham.com? Yeah, okay. so zoeharkham.com, it's, it's okay. um, the, the post that was done, the first post, uh, January 2020. It's on Veganuary, Is It Healthy? Okay. And it goes through all the deficiencies, and it goes through Dr. Michael Greger, who's one of the leading vegans in the world. It goes through his uh, sort of perfect diet, in inverted commons, and it goes through all the deficiencies in that. Um, and it goes through all the co-founders of veganuary actually admitting you'd probably be okay if you do veganuary for a month but any longer than that there are gaps in a diet it's like geez you're the founder of the thing um, <laughs> and, and you're admitting that you really don't want to be doing this for much longer than a month so anyone who thinks it's it's healthier 
is deluding themselves. Don't do it because it's healthier because it's not. The second one, and I really do understand this one, is that people don't, there are a number of people who don't like eating animals. Um, they don't like the idea that these beautiful creatures are killed um, for us to eat, essentially that they are part of the food supply. Now, one of the challenges back is that there's a bit of an, another delusion going on in that vegetarians and vegans appreciate that there is absolutely nothing that they can eat for which nothing has died. They're just not honoring the animal by eating the whole animal, including the awful nose to tail, but there is nothing that they can eat for which nothing has died. So yes, some soy is animals are being displaced in the Amazon and beautiful creatures are being wiped out and killed and burned to death. Orangutans and some of the most beautiful animals on earth for soy to be fed to cattle, which is also insane because cattle should be out grazing in the field. Yeah. But make no mistake, a lot of that is also happening to grow soybeans for the increasing number of people who are becoming vegetarian and vegan. And fish are dying because rivers are being diverted to irrigate crops so that we can grow rapeseed and soybeans and all the rest of it. And if you've ever seen a combine harvester, if you're trying to tell me that wheat and grains and rice and barley and whatever can be harvested without rabbits, voles, birds, worms, whatever else, snakes being hoovered up by that combine, you're dreaming in color because it, it is impossible. There's a great paper called Plant Deaths, uh, sorry, Animal Deaths in Plant Agriculture. Um, your food is killing things as well. It's just you're not actually eating what gets killed. Um, sorry, harsh fact. Uh, I'm a thinker, not a feeling. I, I deal in facts, not uh, not feelings. Hashtag um, sorry. And then the final one. Yeah, hashtag, yeah, get over it. Learn, learn the evidence. Um, and the third one on the planet, um, to me, again, just seems so simple because there is only one thing in the food supply that actually protects and rejuvenates topsoil. And if we don't have topsoil in the world, then we can't grow any food naturally, not meat or eggs or chickens or plants or anything else. Soil is what we currently use to grow food. And of course, ruminants rejuvenate and protect topsoil. And for ruminants, think of goats, uh, cattle, dairy, um, from that cattle sheep and the dairy from that sheep so that's what's protecting topsoil so you take a vegan world and you've got very very few harvests left where you've got topsoil on the planet and then at the point i just done a tweet on this at the point you don't have topsoil then you're reduced to growing food it's called hydroponics you grow food upside down yep. in greenhouses no soil required um, picture a beautiful landscape wherever you drive around and you see beautiful fields and uh, you admire the, the beauty of the countryside, um, then imagine that there's no grass because the topsoil is all gone. There's no soil. All the soil has run off down the roads into the drains. Um, I don't know what that does to the birds and the bees and the animals and the other populations. There's no cows. There's no sheep. We don't need those. There's no chickens. There's no pigs. There's no domestic cats because you can't have uh, they need to eat their carnivores. They need to eat that food. Mm. And basically the landscape is replaced by greenhouses and the greenhouses are growing the food upside down. And the agrochemical companies are some of the biggest backers of things like the Eat Lancet report, which was pretty much a pure vegan plant-based diet. So this sort of James Bond conspiracy theory Armageddon situation they're quite happy with they're there they're ahead of us already they can already cope with trying to provide food i don't know feed the world but they're already trying to get an excess okay um so knowing all that like so when you're when you for instance when you're at your affiliate and you're giving this nutrition one-on-one -on -one talk how do we start to have that conversation? How do we start to, to like, as you were and I were kind of discussing before we record, like, how do we start to change the world and get people into a better headspace, but also a more sustainable, more effective nutrition protocol? That's a really interesting one, actually. I think that's when it, I, I think my three rules hold for everyone. Okay. Eat real food, choose the food for the nutrients and, and eat a maximum of three times a day. I think that really does hold for everyone. Maybe if somebody's trying to gain weight, they want to be grazing and keeping insulin present all the time. But that's a rare scenario, mm -hmm. um, as we know. Um, so what I would then be saying to people is, what is your food goal? What is your health goal? 
Um, are you trying to fuel better for your activity? In which case, become fat adapted. Mm -hmm. And if anyone wants to know more and more on that, I would highly recommend the books by Steve Finney, Jeff Follick, The Art and Science of Low Carb Living and The Art and Science of Low Carb Performance. They are the Bibles on becoming fat adapted. So I'd say okay. become fat adapted and then use carbohydrate to enhance that fat adaptation performance and use it to maintain have your perfect weight whether that means more weight or less weight your power to weight ratio can more easily be controlled than by the carbohydrates um, but for a lot of people even in a crossfit box weight is is, is going to be lose it's going to be one of the goals losing a bit of weight or losing a lot of weight it might be what actually gets somebody into a crossfit box um, that they've heard Greg wants the most unlikely person who could possibly think of themselves in a gym to turn up at a CrossFit box because that's one of the big things that CrossFit is about. It's not just about Matt Fraser and Tia Claire Toomey. Mm -hmm. It's about getting up off the floor when you fall when you're 75 years old or better still not falling because you've actually kept great muscle tone because yeah. you discovered CrossFit in the 50s. You know, that, that's, that's what it's about. And for those people um, who say, I want to lose some weight, then you need to have the calorie conversation. If you ever tried going on an eat less, do more diet, yeah, what happened? I'll tell you what they'll tell you. Oh, I lost a bit of weight and then I regained it and then I, I regained a bit more. Um, so then you can have the conversation that says, okay, so do you think, and they did that more than once, they did it a hundred times. Yeah. Do you think we should try something different. Then I would be saying, so do you know what weight loss actually is? and explaining the state that the body needs in to break down body fat, because that was a penny drop moment last night, I tell you. I mean, you can watch the audience as you're talking, and you just suddenly see the faces, oh my God, and now I realize it's not calories. Yeah. Um, what state you need to be in, and then talk to them about, okay, so how can we help you to get to that state? If you're snacking six times a day at the moment, let's get it to five, let's get it to four, let's get it to three. Are you eating enough at those meals so you can get through to the next meal without needing a snack in between? Maybe bring dinner a little bit earlier. Maybe take breakfast a little bit later. Give your body that chance to burn fat overnight. Hey, you're sleeping and you're losing weight at the same time. How good is that? Uh, and just continually make positive suggestions that are achievable and that the person is prepared to do because at the end of the day, we will do a hell of a lot to lose weight. Yeah. You know, we, we will starve ourselves. We'll go on yep. a liquid diet for six months. Um, but what we're trying with the best will in the world at the moment is not working. And that's why we've got to try something different. Yeah. And what I find almost universal is like the simpler principles are, the more effective it is. So when, and that's what I love about you, like what you gave was very, very simple. Eat real foods, choose them based on nutrient content and don't eat three more than three times a day. I, I mean, I don't know anybody that wouldn't be able to just, wrap their brain around that and then say, yeah, I could probably do that. And, you know, same thing in, in Greg's statement in world-class fitness in a hundred words, which is, you know, you know, eat meats, vegetables, yeah. nuts and seeds, some fruit, little starch, no sugar, you know, keep intake to levels of support, uh, exercise and not body fat. And I'm like, that's pretty simple, you know, that's and it gives, and, and it, and it puts everybody in a state where like, these are the principles Yeah, is long, is live your life however you want inside these principles and it'll be effective. So I think that's really, really cool. Um, we covered a lot and uh, <laughs> we so have, that, haven't we? that is a lot that was uh this is great i was gonna ask you about your opinion on game changers but i don't know if we have that much time on the uh on the podcast uh, do you know, i haven't even watched it because I, oh. I don't like i don't like watching films like that i haven't watched i don't know forks over knives cowspiracy okay. or whatever I know what they're going to say. They're going to yeah. say what we talked about earlier. Yeah. They're either going to try and claim it's healthier or they're going to claim it's better for the animals and they do have some argument there or they're going to claim it's better for the planet and they don't have some argument there. Um, well, the argument so about the that, animals is not, it, I don't even consider that valid because if it's talking about like, listen, if we're going to mass produce animals and, and we're going to raise them inhumanely, then I think everybody agrees on that. But that's yeah, assuming yeah. that there's, that argument is only based on the on the assumption that there's no better alternative like yeah. natural farming, like what they're doing at Polyface yes. Farms, you know. So yes. Joe Eleven, uh, yeah. So um awesome. Where can people find you and, and and what do you have going on? Where's the best place for people to kind of like stay in touch with uh with publications, things that you're doing and things that you're that you're getting into? Yeah, so um the best place to find me is zoeharkham.com. 
Um, I'm hardly ever on Facebook. I do have about, I don't know, 3,000 friends or something. I don't know any of them. I'm <laughs> never in there. I'm on Twitter. So you'll find me on Twitter. Okay. Um, not all the time because it's one of those things that social media just takes time. You just check it every now and again and see if people are chatting about some new paper that maybe you missed. And then it's really helpful. Yeah. Um, what's and, your, and what's your Twitter handle? Just Zoe Harkham. Okay. At, at Zoe Harkham. Okay. Um, so that's where you find me basically. And my sort of what I do at the moment, mostly what I'm known for, I'm, I'm known for my PhD, which looked at the evidence base for the dietary fat guidelines and found that there was none. I'm known for attacking the calorie theory and saying the three and a half thousand thing has got no evidence base. And then I guess I'm known for, I've been doing a Monday note every year for the last 10 years. So if there's anything in the news this week, let's say another Eat Lancet report came out this week, mm -hmm. that would be my Monday note next week. Or there's a paper okay. that comes out that says red meat causes cancer, or you should all have your cholesterol level at sort of nothing. Um, and I basically find the academic paper, put it into plain English, do an exec summary, tell you what you need to worry about, what you don't need to worry about. And that's, that's actually my business model as well. So I do have quite the posts I've mentioned are all on open view, mm -hmm. uh, but that's my sort of business model. If, if people want that, it's a, a pound a week or a dollar a week. I don't even know what it is. My husband runs all of that. Yeah. Um, it's uh it's very reasonable. I went, I went in and was looking at it the other day and I was like, I need to sign up for this. So if anybody's uh, interested to get into the, into the weeds on that stuff, like again, zoeharkham.com, you can sign up for that newsletter. It'll drop you a bunch of information. Um, but yeah. There's uh, a ton of information. And um, are, are you going to any of the DDCs anytime soon? Yeah, I'm going to one in two weeks, actually. We've got one on February the 2nd, Sunday, oh, February the nice. 2nd. Okay. And I think, um, interestingly, the theme there is actually going to be the, the whole game changer scenario. So I think um, there's a lot of different people going. Nina Teichels is going, Gary Taubes, Michael Eads, Robert Lustig, Asim Malhot. Oh, wow. We're trying to get Chris in there because he's done great work on game changers. Yeah. Um, but we're all trying to do short presentations instead of the longer presentations that tend yeah. to happen at DBC, 20 minutes each, and then and just generally talk about the whole plant-based movement and um, and why it's not good and, and why the summary that you beautifully um, said, the CrossFit summary, meat, veg, nuts, seeds, all of that, mm -hmm. why that is just so much better. So that's what we're off to do in a couple of weeks time. Man, I'd love to be a fly on that wall. Um, <laughs> well, Are you not a derelict doctor? Can you not go along? Are you not I, could, I mean, I can pretend to be a doctor of something. And it just, <laughs> um, but uh, listen, I know you're very, very busy. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Uh, really appreciate it. I think people are going to get a lot out of this. I think there was some very useful information here, particularly for the box owners, because I do know having, have owned, having owned an affiliate for 10 years, that this can be a very, very tough bridge to cross when you're trying to help people and change their lives. But I think there's a lot of really good nuggets here. So thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks, Jason. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Best Hour of Their Day. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. How cool is that? There's a creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer, so it becomes super simple. Some of these episodes with Fern or Todd or myself chatting with one another, we've done right within the app itself. Anchor will make it easy to distribute your podcast to all platforms, Spotify, Apple, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make an awesome podcast in one place. All you have to do is download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Come on, who doesn't have Spotify at this point? And if you were unaware, Spotify now is offering podcasts. That's right. On Spotify, you can listen to all your favorite artists, but also podcasts in one place for free. Spotify has a huge catalog of podcasts on every topic, including the one you're listening to right now, best hour of their day. On Spotify, you can follow your favorite podcasts so you never miss an episode. Premium users can even download episodes to listen to offline wherever you are, something I always do before I hop on a plane. And you can even easily share what you're listening to with your friends on Instagram and other social media platforms. 
Here's the deal. If you haven't done so already, be sure to download the Spotify app, search for best hour of their day on Spotify, or browse some other podcasts if you want. You can find them in your library tab. And also make sure to follow me so you never miss an episode of best hour of their day. Thanks again for listening to Best Hour of Their Day. Just a reminder, Fern and I have an amazing new show called Dropping In, premiering on our YouTube channel in early 2020. Be sure to head over to the Best Hour of Their Day YouTube channel now. Subscribe so you don't miss any of the episodes. You've probably heard us talking about it, summarizing some of our trip. You can see some highlights up on our Instagram as well, at best hour of their day. But I promise you, you're not going to want to miss out. So subscribe now. Thanks for everything you do. Thanks for letting us be a part of your lives. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Tune in tomorrow for another episode of Best Hour of Their Day.